Hi, this is Rachel McElroy. Hello, this is Griffin McElroy. And this is wonderful. The podcast adaptation of the movie of the novel based on a book. <laughs> no, I love it. Keep it. Keep it no, going. No, it stinks. Let's keep going with I've that. I've run out of intro juice. Oh, no. I know. It's like the you last... You know, you could toss it to me every once in a while. Okay, let's start over. Okay. Hey, this is Griffin McElroy. Hi, this is Rachel McElroy. And this is wonderful. Hey, it's it's a hot one. Yeah, all right, yeah. I, Shit, why didn't I think of it's a hot <laughs> one? Because then you could, there's so many directions you could go with that. Right? You could be like hot enough for you. You could be like like something, something in the midday yeah, uh-huh, sun. Uh-huh. Is 2018 the year of uh, Carlos Santana and Rob Thomas's smooth? Do you think 2018 is the year of smooth? Like, is, is it coming back? Do you think it is the year of smooth? If they were going to remake that song with two different artists, who would they be? Rob Thomas. Okay, let's keep him. And Carlos <laughs> Santana. Okay. I mean, why mess with perfection? Yeah, that, and here's why I picked them in yeah. sort of my mm-hmm. fantasy draft for yeah. remaking Smooth by Rob <laughs> Thomas and Carlos Santana yeah. is because they know the song pretty good already. Uh-huh, yeah. And if I'm looking at people's resume for this job I'm hiring for, which is to remake Smooth by Carlos Santana and Rob Thomas, uh-huh. is I want you to have some experience, at least five years experience making Smooth. Uh huh. By Robert Thomas and Carlos Santana. Uh huh. No, I like that. I, like I can't that. think of too many other people who did it. So, see, that was a good intro. You're right, and that was all you. That was all me. You brought that that, <laughs> that four seamer right over the plate. You got any small wonders though for me? I do actually. I wanted to mention uh, the thing we watched this week, which was Nanette by Hannah Gadsby. Yes, it was very good. It was very very good. We knew n- literally nothing going into it other than it was supposed to be good, and it was very it, very it, good. It had been written about a lot of times, and it is. Um, and not immediately apparent why I almost said it's immediately apparent. It's yeah. not, but by the time you hit the end of it, you're like, oh, okay, that's yeah, why you think like about you're this. just watching a comedy special, uh, and that it is that it is that it's just and extremely much, funny. much more, and so much more. Yeah. Uh, go watch it, it's on Netflix. Um, I always say queso, just had some downstairs, Ooh. uh, pretty good. It's uh, basically like hot cheese that's in a liquid form Mm -hmm. and it's pretty good now if you were gonna remake queso Mm. who would you rob thomas melted down (laughs) his bones yeah (laughs) i had another one but i cannot remember for the life of me we finished great british bake-off season five Mm -hmm. i don't know why that took so long to go stateside but you know it's a good one there's nothing there are very few shows that kind of like fill that gap in Mm -hmm. in my life um, I did not, I remember when we watched like the first three seasons in a row back when we like discovered the show, that's when I like bought a mixer and like a big board and a rolling pin. I was like, I'm going to bake and I baked no. and now I did not really have that with this. And I was just trying to think of what the difference was. And it's approximately one child. It's about <laughs> one son. It's about one son's worth of just sort of constant. That's very low true. Level Griffin exhaustion. and I tend to prioritize our free time with sleeping, sleeping and eating queso while watching American Ninja Warrior. Yes, I'm not ashamed of it. It's what we were literally doing before we walked up the stairs. Um. Anyway, I think I go first this week. You do, and I want to talk about starting out. A YouTube channel, because this is what I spend apparently 90% of my day doing, 90% of my free time that is not uh, dedicated to Sleep or American Ninja Warrior Cheese Party, is watching YouTube. And there's a YouTube channel I've discovered, because it just showed up in my sidebar, which I showed Rachel yesterday, is fucking buck wild. (laughs) It's like videos of like these guys who throw huge darts into like old printers from 45 meters up. Well, Griffin tried to present this to me as if this was some sort of fault of YouTube. No. He's like, look at this garbage. It's and like I was like, that, you, know, you made that. It's a history of speed running and like destiny guides. And then it's like uh, so much bon appetit. It's wild. Anyway, the one I want to talk about is a YouTube channel called Kiwami Japan. And this channel is very good. It's a channel where one very dedicated, very inspired craftsman, he who goes under the username Kiwami Japan, uh, has created this channel that is entirely dedicated to kitchen knives. I have shown you 
I think one, if not two of these videos, we may have watched it in bed the other day. Um, and it's all about kitchen knives. Some of the videos are about like restoring these old, like fancy Japanese kitchen knives to like their former glory just by like polishing them. Where they make knives too? Yes. Yeah. They have stuff where they take like a $1 knife and then like polish it with very expensive, uh, whetstones until it's like it can cut through space and time. But the thing that they are like, I find those videos, like those sort of not less novel videos, very satisfying in a way that I can't really explain. Like I'm really into sort of craftiness these days, but like practical craftiness. I'm also into bad craftiness, like the videos we watch on Facebook when we want to have a quick larf before yes. we go to sleep. There's one y'all and it's like hot <laughs> tips. And this woman walks into an apartment with a guy and she has a hole in her black sock and she looks all embarrassed. And then the video, it says, here's what you should do. And she pulls out a little black Sharpie and just colors in her toe so it matches the sock. It's the wildest fucking thing. Do we want to talk about the hot dog destroyer? We have to have talked about the hot dog destroyer. I'm not sure that we did. Somebody takes a big... Like a, like a syringe. Syringe, cuts off the front of it, pokes holes in the front of it, and then sort of does a crisscross of wires. And then they put the plunger back in the syringe, and then they put a hot dog in that sort of channel <laughs> and push it through these this I wire grid. It is a commonplace need to have a shredded hot dog. It's wild to me. It was like a <laughs> it was like a trap in one of the and cube the amount movies. Of time they like burn little holes. It's one by one into the syringe and very carefully place little wires. There's no way it. you save yourself more time than cutting up hot dogs for the rest exactly. of your life. Anyway. Anyway. What they also do on this channel is they make knives. And when I say make knives, I mean they make them out of things that aren't knife stuff. Uh, I'm talking about things like wood and ice. That's wild, right? Oh, a wood knife. They actually make it really, really sharp. And then they can, you know, cut cut up foods in the kitchen. All of the things are very, very practical. But that is like the, that is the tip of the substance iceberg. He's made knives out of cardboard before, uh, out of plastic bottles. Uh, his latest episode, he makes a knife out of underwear. Uh, he yeah, that's makes, the one I watched. He makes uh, knives out of food, which is cyclical in a way that I really appreciate. Things like uh, chocolate and like gummy candy and rice gummy? oh i want to see the gummy one the gummy candy one is very very good and if you're wondering how like this is possible most of the videos involve him like sort of uh reducing these materials down to some sort of pliable state like stewing the cardboard in water yeah. uh and then kind of like pressing it together into one like solid block and then dehydrating and drying it out for like a super long time until it becomes firm and then uh you know cutting that into a knife shape and then using whetstone throwing it into a knife um and that's kind of the process he goes through and it's really satisfying to have watched enough of his videos to like watch him make a knife out of gummy candy and be like, okay, so next he's going to pop it in the old dehydrator. Yep. Here we go. Like knowing his, <laughs> this weird craft that this guy does. Um, these videos though, they aren't just like DIY overviews. They are, there's like a lot of humor and like personality in them too. he never speaks, never shows his face. It's just him doing stuff in the kitchen. Um, so like for instance, there's an episode, a fairly recent one, I think where he makes a uh, two knives out of, of pasta where he like mills it down to this fine pasta flour uh which he turns into a kind of a paste and then he forms that into a knife and he dries it out and then sort of sharpens it into a knife and then he does a demonstration uh with each of these two knives and one of them is not as sharp as the other one so he throws it into boiling water and then <laughs> makes a bechamel sauce and then eats that knife <laughs> It's like very, there's like so much like prop comedy going on in these videos. Uh, and there's a lot of like really, f ex like a lot of experimentation that's kind of fun to watch. Like the rice video, he had to mill the rice down to this very, very fine powder. So he invented this tumbler where he put these heavy stones in with the rice powder in this glass bottle and then built a sort of like rotation device out of rolling pins and a drill. And he had to like dial in like how fast he wanted the drill to go to spin the rolling pins to roll this bottle full of rocks and rice dust. It's like really, really entertaining to watch. Um, it's, it's so good. A lot of the videos are really like straightforward, but a lot of them are like, he goes through some pretty unexpected links and then makes some surprisingly extremely practical, very useful kitchen knives. Uh, I just like this idea. I find myself drawn to like crafty videos like this that are especially like transformative and yeah. especially like we're going to transform this uh, seemingly useless thing into something very useful, like videos of like people building houses in their backyard using like, you know, mud, like is my yeah. shit. Uh, and this is, this is peak to me because not only is it like kind of surprising that you can make a knife out of underwear, uh, it's like, it's, it's very entertaining too. 
Again, it's called Kiwami Japan. Do you think he'll expand to like other implements? Um, I just almost think he has. I think maybe he has. There's probably other people do. I like the idea also of just a, there's a person out there who has found this thing and become the best person in the world at it. Mm-hmm. That really appeals to me. Of course. What's your first thing? My first thing is kinetic sculpture. This is sculpture that can move stuff with its mind? That's That would be telekinetic sculpture, I think. It's a sculpture that you can talk to? With your mind? It's just a sculpture that moves. Oh, shoot. <laughs> I messed up. Uh, so I thought of this because I've always been really into mobiles. Yes, mobiles or mobi- mobiles? I, oh, man. Or mobiles. I spent a fair amount of time trying to figure this out. Yeah? Because uh, I knew I was going to have to say it over and over again. I think I say mobiles, but I'm from Appalachia and saying, like, 40% of words incorrectly? I think I'm going to stick with mobile. Okay. Um, Don't be pedantic. You know what fucking word we're talking about, people at home. <laughs> so I've been um, for a long time, um, but it kind of became a big thing for me when I was actually writing poetry. And my um, preceptor at University of Chicago, who was kind of... What's that? Oh, <laughs> It's like a it's like a fancy word for like teaching assistant kind of. It's like a mentor but in like a teaching capacity. Is this like a common grad school word? I don't know that it is. Um It sounds badass. It sounds like something <laughs> that's like at Hogwarts that like patrols the halls at night to make sure the kids don't get up to pranks. We were we were divided cuz so there's a bunch of research that says if a student is in a cohort, uh they're more likely to finish their program. In a what? Oh, geez. No, come on. You can't act like I'm the weird one here. My cohort preceptor. In, in, <laughs> in education, specifically higher education, there's a bunch of research that, that says if you pair like a group of students together and do a lot of relationship building among those students and enroll them in similar classes and have some kind of mentorship, they're more likely to finish their program. Okay. And so the program I was doing was very rigorous. It was a year long. And so they clustered us all into these groups and gave us like a one like post-grad like doctoral candidate person who would kind of supervise us like meet with us once a week help us and they were the preceptor Preceptor. of of your breakfast club that you were in okay which one were you because i think a lot of people would say ali sheedy but i I do not think that's i I mean if i was going to be anybody i'm not molly ringwald yay molly ringwald you did um, tape a kid's butt cheeks together that one time. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm so sorry to derail you. It's just you said some really fascinating words there, and I loved learning from you. <laughs> uh, so anyway, so my preceptor used that as an analogy to writing a poem of, of like a mobile, if you change one word or change the rhythm of a particular line, you can set the whole peace and motion in a different direction and i just found that like idea really captivating and i had always really liked mobiles and so i'd like kind of latched onto it sure uh and the kind of the famous kinetic sculptor is i don't know it's uh alexander calder why would I, why on god's green earth would i know I that no I, I feel like his mobiles are very iconic like there are there are just like the standard go-to if you're thinking I know, of mobile. But like, you know how. You know well, let's say know. Let's talk off mic really quick. Okay. <laughs> I'm not very cultured. <laughs> you know this. I mean, you talk about E.E. E. Cummings a bunch. That's one. I can learn about that in middle school. Everybody <laughs> knows about E.E. E. Cummings. He does the silly word poems. <laughs> you know how you learn about him in school? And they're like, look at all these fucking silly words. It's like, dude, learn how to make a fucking paragraph already. Why don't you capitalize some letters, E.E.? E. I know, dog. Anyway, we can get back on the mic now. It's just you've humiliated me. I'm sorry. <laughs> in front of all my friends. Uh, so Alexander Calder in the 1930s started creating these uh, kinetic sculptures that it was actually uh, the avant-garde artist Marcel Duchamp named uh, Mobiles. And I read a couple different things, but the idea is that it's a French pun because mobile means both motion and motive 
or like a word similar to that. I don't know. Okay. I didn't research that. Uh, so for a while, he was making these motor or crank driven moving sculptures. And uh, he kind of found those to be a little predictable and repetitive. Uh, and, and it became kind of less exciting to him. Sure. You want that, uh, you want that chaos theory in there. Uh, so he, what he did is he took many balanced parts joined by lengths of wire uh, whose individual elements were capable of moving independently uh, when prompted by air movement or direct contact. Interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, these were often outdoor pieces, which were set in motion by the open air. The wind mobiles features abstract shapes delicately balanced on pivoting rods that moved with the slightest current of air. Uh, what was funny is that later in his uh, artistic career, he started creating these static abstract sculptures that didn't move. And one of his artist friends called them stables. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. I also imagine people would be like, this talk of the town, like, did you see the new Calder piece up? It's at the museum. Oh, I'm going to go there. And then you roll up and you're like, let's give this motherfucker a shove. And it's like, wait, <laughs> what? It didn't didn't go so there's a huge collection of them at the national gallery in washington dc uh they have more than 40 sculptures and paintings uh and then 19 long-term loans from the calder foundation uh, i've never been to the national gallery but i was looking online and it's just like the entrance has them kind of hanging from the ceiling and then there's a whole room dedicated to his mobiles and they have all these lights set up so you can see like the shadows on oh, the wall cool. But wait, um, if it's indoors, how do they go? I mean, there's air conditioning, maybe just a little breeze. I guess so. Get some going. There's some stop motion videos on YouTube too, which I definitely watched today. Oh, like wow. a nerd. <laughs> it's like a minute and a half and it's just an entire day's worth of slight movement. <laughs> it didn't move and then you realized you were looking at one of his, it was just a JPEG of one of his non-moving sculptures. <laughs> um. One quote that I found of his uh, talking about these mobiles, he said, I have made a number of things for the open air. All of them react to the wind and are like sailing vessels in that they react best to one kind of breeze. What's that mean, dog? That's just kind of, I mean, they're all very delicately balanced. And so depending which direction the wind's coming from, you're going to get like the most interesting movement. Right. But that must be shitty for her, everybody around him when he's like unveiling it. And he's like, yeah, I wish it was good, but the breeze is. <laughs> I mean, they're the still interesting to look at. Yeah, but he seen, knows and you know. Do you know what I'm talking about when I like talk about his mobiles? Yeah. Do you, I, I know they, you they, there was something like this, probably not one of his at the Huntington Museum of yeah, Art. Yeah, but yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah, um, I think they're interesting to look at whether they're moving or not. But I like this idea that it is a piece of art that continues to change. I mean, some of this was at like the Hakone. Yeah, sure. They had some, uh, at the Hakone Open Air Museum, they had some kinetic sculptures. And I just always find it like so engaging because it's just like, it's it's more dynamic and, and you feel more like you're watching a performance. Hmm, interesting. Uh, and so I just, I, I don't know. I've always find them really enjoyable. Um, and also like the engineering that goes into the art of it. Yeah. It's fascinating. No, exactly. That was his, his background. If I remember correctly, when I was researching him, he has kind of an engineering background. Hmm. So I just found that interesting that he kind of channeled that into his art. Uh, so I just wanted to end. There's this quote uh, by Jean-Paul Sartre. Uh, that I used um, when I was doing research for my thesis. Um, and I just I love it, so I wanted to share it. Yeah, just let me know this art. <laughs> a mobile, one might say, is a little private celebration, an object defined by its movement and having no other existence. It is a flower that fades when it ceases to move. I possess a bird of paradise with iron wings. It needs only to be touched by a breath of warm air, the bird ruffles up with a jingling sound, rises, spreads its tail, shakes its crested head, executes a dance step, and then, as if obeying a command, makes a complete about turn with wings outspread. Sart. Isn't that lovely? Always gets me. That is really nice. I, I, I just, they're like these little live things, you know? I've always kind of wanted one. Well, let's get one. But uh, when you look up mobile online, it, it's, you, baby stuff. it's baby stuff. <laughs> you can buy like recreations. Um, 
but I'd want to hang it in a particular, you know, it's, a, it's, there's some work to be done. Yeah. Uh, but I love them. Well, somebody's got a birthday coming up. Not, not especially soon. I was talking about my dad. <laughs> That's true. Next month. Yeah. I'm going to get him some, um, probably some DVDs. Okay. <laughs> Is unrelated. I just remembered um, that his birthday's coming up, and I need to get looking for those DVDs. Mm-hmm. Can I steal you away? You started doing some experiment with like tempo these days, and like mm-hmm. tempo and mm-hmm. like meter in a way that like I feel like you're on the cutting edge of like discovering a sort of new genre. I like this idea that this is somebody's first episode and they have no idea what just happened. Sorry, that was a home improvement in your stitchel music. And we <laughs> still do that because we made a joke about it once and couldn't think of anything better. <laughs> and that's the truth. I would love to tell you, though, about our sponsors this week, if you would allow me the chance to do that, by which I mean type in my password because my computer shut off. Please do. And I'm jacked in. I want to tell you about Blue Apron. Oh, hey, Blue Apron. Hi, Blue Apron. How are you? Blue Apron delivers little boxes, and inside of those boxes are ingredients and instructions that you need to make delicious home-cooked meals right in your home. Uh, They got, I'm sorry, I need to be more specific. The ingredients are pre-portioned. Don't worry about portioning them. There's a person who took care of that for you. And they the recipes, don't worry if they're out of order or not. They're step-by-step recipes. <laughs> a lot of places will send you the box. The food will come in wild sizes. <laughs> they will send you like 19 gourds. And it's like, I only need a, you know, a pinch of gourd. <laughs> The recipe calls for two pinches of gourd, and then you've sent me 19 entire gourds. Well, let's see what I have to do about them. Step one, enjoy the meal. Step two, now that your gourds are peeled, like, come on, guys. Put them in order. Put them in the order. Step by step, preferably. And once you do the steps and you get the pre-portioned ingredients and do what the steps say, you can cook these meals in under 45 minutes. The menu changes every week based on what's in season, and it's designed by Blue Aprons and House Culinary Team. So you can just go ahead and skip all the meal planning and all the gourd measuring and get straight to cooking with Blue Apron. You can enjoy delicious meals that are great on the grill like honey chipotle glazed chicken with poblano and lime rice add smoky depth to your dinner while enjoying the warm weather and getting those perfect grill marks with incredible ingredients and chef designed recipes blue apron lets you see what the power of food can do can you believe like i never did commercial via like i totally could have with like, my dad's work but like i could sell anything with this with that not not with my voice but i feel like i can get the cadence pretty good you definitely have like energy mm. you know which i think is crucial so you can be like it's sticky it's fun you can throw it at the wall it's gack it comes in all kinds of bright colors and it's gonna stain all your shit up so bad <laughs> you know what isn't gack though well, blue apron blue apron <laughs> blue apron is very good so check out this week's menu and get your first three meals for free by at blueapron.com slash rose that's blueapron.com slash rose to get your first three meals free, Blue Apron, a better way to cook. I also want to talk about MeUndies. If you need soft, wonderful underwear that you could turn into a knife, <laughs> what? No, I, I mean, I... Am I still doing the voice? Because it's not... A little bit, Oh, yeah. man, it's completely subconscious. <laughs> MeUndies is very good. They make soft underwear you can turn it into a knife. Was that better? Yes. Okay, they come in fun designs, and they're really comfy. They feel as good as they look. If you haven't tried them before, listen up. They are made from a sustainably sourced material that sort of hails from the beechwood tree. And I have so many pairs of MeUndies. I don't mean to brag, but I have more pairs. I would be actually embarrassed to admit how many pairs I have, because you would think, like, why does he need that many underwears? Um, Does he have, you know, a mess down there sometimes? Um, and I don't. They're very striking. They're so very striking. It, it's a good way for me to keep tabs on whether or not Griffin is changing his underwear. And? He is. Every day. <laughs> <laughs> and listen, if you're not sure, MeUndies has a deal for our listeners. First-time purchasers can get 15% off their first pair of MeUndies and free shipping. And if you're already part of the MeUndies fam, tell your friends about it through their referral program. They'll get a discount and you'll get store credit. Win-win. So to get 15% off your first pair, free shipping, and a 100% satisfaction guarantee, go to MeUndies.com slash wonderful. It's MeUndies.com slash wonderful. Hey, Griffin. Ah. Uh, we have some messages. Tell me all about it. Tell me about it. We have a message for Chrisanna from Alex. Happy approximate birthday, Chrisanna. Thank you for nearly seven years of friendship, courtship, and moreship. 
I love you so much. I want to tell the world that you, a 24-year-old adult, thought BYOB stood for bring your own bananas until recently. Why would it? Why would that? Why? <laughs> and that's adorable. Please forgive me for exposing your deepest shame. It's very good. I think I thought BYOB was something other than it actually was. Like, I knew it was bring your own, but I didn't think it was bananas. I thought it was something a little more universal. Yeah, I thought it was more like beef or burgers. Or breakfast. Or- I don't know that I thought of breakfast, but uh, I just know that like usually that it's listed on like barbecue invitations. Yeah. So obviously it's I bring, thought it was like bring your own barbecue sauce. Yeah, we're having a barbecue. <laughs> bring your own. <laughs> um, that was a very sweet message. What, how far off did we fuck that up? Uh, it was preferred April. Okay. So, so that's about uh, And on the average these days across all of our podcasts, we're fucking up about three months worth every time. So okay. it's good that we're consistent. Uh, This next message is for Sarah. It is from Jill. I can't believe we're turning 30 this year, which means that we've basically been together half our lives, but I couldn't be happier with where our life together has taken us. Thanks for being an amazing wife and loving me through all my sour candy overdoses and late nights of video games long after I should have come to bed. Love you, bookworm. Sour candy overdose is not anything to joke around about. And late nights of video games, Griffin, this sounds... I mean, it might be me, but (laughs) you you gotta be careful. You eat enough of those atomic warheads. It will just, it's like you've poured paint thinner all over your mouth and gets it all raw. And then you eat the ranch Pringles while you're at church camp. And it's a miracle I'm standing here in front of you today. (laughs) While sitting. (laughs) Are stacks of unread books taking over your apartment? Do you constantly miss your train stop because you're caught up in reading? I'm Bria Grant. And I'm Mallory O'Mara. We party hard. And by party hard, we mean read books. So join us every Thursday on Reading Glasses, a maximum fun podcast about reading and book culture. Get more out of your reading life. We'll help you conquer your to-be-read pile. Get out of that book slump. And squeeze more reading time into your busy day. Learn Learn how how to to read better. better. (laughs) Wow, that was good. (laughs) I have a second thing. Oh, good. It is a thing that I mentioned it to Rachel that I was going to do it. And her response is, I cannot believe you haven't done this yet. And then she actually went to wonderful.fyi, a very good website. And double checked. And double checked that I hadn't done it. And I haven't. Uh, It is a musical artist. Uh, His name is Tallest Man on Earth. And I uh, specifically kind of want to focus on one of his albums that was released in 2010, and it's called The Wild Hunt. Uh, so Tallest Man on Earth is uh, a Swedish guy named Christian Matson, who is a, a Swedish singer, songwriter, who's been making music since like 2005 or so. And um, I just absolutely adore his work. It's kind of perfectly in my wheelhouse. It's just like real good acoustic folk music, a lot of open-tuned guitars, uh, just like exactly my shit his musical inspirations are like bob dylan which i think is going to be immediately apparent if you've never heard him before as soon as we play some of his music uh but like also like nick drake and woody guthrie and pete seeger and folks Can I like tell that you something mm-hmm. i had never really listened to his stuff before i met griffin yeah and uh now when i hear it i think of you it just oh. feels very quintessentially griffin to me that's very sweet yeah, yeah. i mean there was a long time there where It was all I listened to, Mm -hmm. kind of. Um, So he has all these, like, folk inspirations that I really, like, find attractive. And his lyrics are, like, really evocative and often kind of inscrutable in a way that I really enjoy. Um, So this album, The Wild Hunt, came out in 2010. It was his second album. His first album, uh, Hollow Grave, came out in 2008. It's also very good. Uh, But I heard this album, The Wild Wild Hunt, for the first time when I was living in Chicago. Uh, This was in in 2010. And um, I got to tell you, I cannot think of a better album for, like, walking to the train station on like a nice cool autumn day in chicago than this like that was Mm -hmm. sort of that's the mental connection that i kind of make with it just sort of like walking to the train by myself with my headphones on going usually nowhere important just somewhere to kind of get out of the house for a little (laughs) bit um i listened to this album for like a fucking year like pretty much every day and that was kind of a a lonely year for me like i had my had friends like my roommates and i were, were were good friends but like i didn't know that many people in chicago and so this album was just kind of a kind of a nice companion during that time so 
if you've never heard uh, Tallest Man on Earth before, he has a very distinctive voice, um, which you're going to hear in this. I, I'm going to play a little bit of the title track to The Wild Hunt, which really encapsulates like what I like about his music bringing it as. Uh, the entry for this song is fucking great because the theories that people are floating are wild. Um, and I don't blame them because like I wouldn't know how to begin putting this song together into a message. The lyrics are just, they're very clever and they're full of imagery, but like, they're kind of hard to interpret like the line rumor has it that i wasn't born i just walked in one frosty morn into the vision of some vacant mind like all of the lyrics of this song are like that and i don't really know what it means but i i like it a lot um so i wanted to just talk about this album the wild hunt because i love it and i think you would really enjoy it too or maybe you won't listener at home you should listen to it but while i was prepping for this segment i found a youtube video that he posted of a cover that he did of Joni mitchell's both sides now uh, which i immediately sent to rachel because it was so good uh he covered this song for like a video series he did and has this like intro where he explains that it's the greatest song ever written and that is such a relief to him because now he's (laughs) free to not try to write the greatest song ever written um and then he did this cover of both sides now which i also adore if you are not familiar if you've seen love actually it's the very very sad song that plays when um oh my god i can't remember her name what's that actress's name i always get her confused with the woman who plays hermione in the harry potter movies i'm gonna get there emma watson emma thompson wow good work so anyway, when she's like crying, it's this is the song that's playing. <laughs> it's a very, very good song. It's a really good song, and there's a really good cover. I'm going to play it now. Now it's just another show. You leave them laughing when you go. And if you care, don't let them know. Don't give yourself away. I looked at love from both sides now. From give and take and still somehow it's love solutions that I recall No, I really don't know love at all I don't really have anything else to add about this. Like it's, it's, uh, it has broken my sort of theme of talking about this one album, but it's so, so good. Have you seen him besides the time we saw him here in Austin? No, I only saw him that one time. I would love to see him again. There was a heckler in the audience. The heckler, after he finished playing a song, yelled out, stop being so talented. (laughs) It was very, very pure. (laughs) It was very, very good. I think that was the same person. There's a song he has, I think, called uh, Brother or Brothers. Uh, that has this like wild sort of not solo but just like instrumental yeah. break that he just like goes down the whole neck of the guitar uh, and that same dude just went like damn in the middle of this like <laughs> pretty acoustic song anyway uh, this cover is really good he has a lot of other covers I mentioned I Want You by Bob Dylan he has a banjo cover of Paul Simon's Graceland Whoa. that is my favorite cover of my favorite of Paul Simon song so check that out it is fucking great and he puts all these like he when he covers a song he does just like cover it he puts like a very distinctive spin on it that I really enjoy um i just really love his music it occupies a very singular space in my mind not just for like in terms of uh genre like he is kind of the ideal folk music creator for me but also in like you know i have a lot of sense memory i feel like tied to tied to his music in this album in particular yeah what's your second thing my second thing is also a uh, musician it is charles bradley hell yes Okay, Charles Bradley is somebody that I was introduced to by a listener of the show, Anna Roach. Oh, yeah. Who is a big fan of soul music and was very uh, insistent that we all go see him when he came to the Austin City Limits Music Festival. He was, I feel like there was a very, there was a connection for Austin and him because it's where, and that where the movie, there's so much, uh, sorry, I don't want to spoil. Oh, so the movie about his life premiered at south by southwest yeah so that may be what i feel like everybody i know in austin is like a huge charles bradley yeah, fan like it's a weird like everybody here like knows who he, who he was it occurred to me when i was researching this that maybe there were some listeners that hadn't yeah for sure I, I do not think that that is the case for everywhere yeah uh so charles bradley and and once we play a clip from his music you'll be able to hear it right away um actually started his musical career at 19 as a James Brown impersonator named Black Velvet. 
Yes. And you will hear that uh, in his music for sure. Um, but prior to that, uh, he was born in 1948 in Florida, raised by his grandmother until his mom returned at age eight and took him off to New York. And then he led kind of a turbulent life. Uh, he didn't get along with his mom. And so he ran away and was homeless briefly. Uh, but then at 14, his sister took him to the Apollo to see James Brown and it just changed his whole life. Uh, and then, so after he was a James Brown impersonator, uh, he eventually went back to uh, odd jobs and periodic gigs and continued to kind of have this rough life. Uh, and then in 2001, at age 53, he was introduced to the co-founder of Daptone Records, who took him to the producer, songwriter, and guitarist Tom Brennick, uh, which became uh, the Menahan Street Band, which backs yeah. Charles Bradley. Uh, and that's when uh, they recorded some 45s in 2011. And then at 62, he released his debut LP, No Time for Dreaming. And it is a fucking masterpiece. Yeah. It is so... G- uh, and he was so grateful uh, and just humbled by by that. Um, and and it, it was just like, I would say even more than like, James Brown or you know it he obviously the performance was great and the voice is, is great and and the lyrics and everything but just how much of himself he brought uh to the music like it, it you just feel very connected uh to him when he sings yeah. uh it's very nice uh to listen to uh and and to feel that much emotion from an artist um So, yeah, so I I immediately developed this, like, very strong fondness. And I feel like anybody who kind of spends some time with his music feels that. Especially people that – I feel like that's why everybody I know here in Austin, why they, like, love him so much is because they all saw him perform at South by Southwest. Yeah. Well, yeah, I I saw him perform, like, three times in, like, you know, four years or whatever. It was like I never missed an opportunity uh, to see him uh, just because it was so powerful. And you just – you felt so – happy for him you know that he was somebody with this immense talent that was finally getting an opportunity to be recognized for it yeah that's our episode before we wrap up i'm going to tell you about some of the things that our uh, friends at home playing the home version of wonderful are into and uh, here's danny who says my nightly routine has always been brushing my teeth then going straight to bed it's always been a chore though i've never liked brushing my teeth so a trick i've developed is brushing them well before i hit the hay that way when i go to sleep it feels like i've cheated the system and i'm a happier boy <laughs> danny my dude <laughs> I started doing this too. It is dope. It is so well, good. Well, you kind of do it out of necessity because I go to sleep much earlier than you. That's true. And I don't want uh, to disturb you with the what if sounds of the like moans little... of pleasure I do when I brush my teeth. <laughs> what about like if you want a little snack though? You know? I'll still eat it. Griffin. I'm supposed to not eat for like a couple hours after I brush my teeth? <laughs> Once I brush my teeth, like I Your have mouth. closed up shop. <laughs> I don't know who's wrong here. I think Am you I, are. Is it wild to, if you brush? The, the part of brushing your teeth is to get your mouth all clean before you go to sleep. And if you eat something, you're getting it all dirty again. But I brush my teeth in the morning and then I drink coffee and eat breakfast right away. But so you're letting those food particles just sit in your teeth all night. Who gives a shit? Like I've got teeth do a uh, Griffin. You have no leg to stand on here. Like you're. Oh, yeah. Cavity count. Ready? Count of three. One, two, three, two, like twelve. Okay. <laughs> Our second one is sent in by Sarah, who says, The thing I want to talk about is working on homework with friends. It's especially good when you aren't working on the same things. I just love sitting with a friend or two and getting shit done. We're all in grad school, so there's endless work, and this way we can hang out and be productive all at once. It's even better because we usually meet up in libraries. I love libraries. That could be a whole other email. But yeah, I love doing homework with friends and quietly motivating each other through the endless grad school slog. Yes. I mean, I love the idea of it. Did you never do like study group? You, oh, we did. Where you eat a bunch of snacks and yeah. just hang out and get work done? Uh, except for the last thing. Oh, Griffin. It was mostly me and Patrick Stanley hanging out, writing our capstone paper the night before <laughs> it's oh, due, Griffin. pulling an all nighter, taking a quick break to go and play through all of Mega Man X, then go back into the the, the study. You were exactly the kind of student that I resented. <laughs> yeah. And then I got, you know, 
a good A on that kind of song. So no big deal. <sighs> but I like the idea of it. I bet you can't do that in grad school. I bet they'll find out. <laughs> did you beat Mega Man X last night instead of... Yes, I did. I'm sorry. <laughs> Your second page is really influenced by Mega Man X. It's a walkthrough of Mega Man X that you printed out in the same batch as your capstone. I mean, I do, I do appreciate knowing how to beat uh, Spark Mandrill, but uh, I'm a... <laughs> I was wondering what Flame Mammoth's weakness was. Now I'm just trying to remember all the bosses in Mega Man X. There was a penguin, there was a chameleon. Did you say Spark Mandrill? Yeah. It'd be a good roller derby name. Yeah, it would. A lot of the names. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of them was like a boomerang head man. I've lost it. Uh, Eric says, a summer threat... <laughs> That can't be right. <laughs> a summer treat? A summer threat I find quite wonderful are snow cones. <laughs> They're everywhere. The silent killers. <laughs> Everyone has fond memories of them. Which may, That's my fuck up and not this person's. I hope everybody at home knows that. It says treat. Everyone has fond memories of them, which make them feel immediately nostalgic, especially with friends on a hot summer day enjoying your time off school. Plus, all the different flavor and color combination make them endless fun and weirdly beautiful for just being shaved ice covered in sugar juice. We got to get some snowballs before the summer's over. We do. I'll say this on the subject of snow cones. They are the most um, mercurial in terms of quality food out there i think because if you get this shit that's like pebbles of ice with a little bit of just sugar water poured on it yeah. that's gross and then the water goes all the way to the bottom gross no good and the yeah. juice like goes all the way bottom yeah and then like the top is just straight ice and yeah. flavorless ice Terrible. fuck that proper shaved ice and i'm talking about that fine powder that sweet cotton <laughs> Mixed in with like heap and help into juice that's like actual actually tastes like something. Oh my god, it is there is nothing better. Especially if it's like flavors that aren't just like cherry, blue raspberry. What's the place like down Casey Snowballs. Casey Snowballs makes a plate it makes just like the best snow cones you've ever it's tasted. It's like New Orleans inspired somehow. Yeah. Or and from they, New Orleans. They also do like an ice cream thing where you can get like a, a snow cone ball on top of an ice cream scoop. Oh my god. Oh my god. It's so fucking good. Um, anyway, yeah, snow cones are dope and really dangerous. Um, thank you to Bowen and Augustus <laughs> for the use of our theme song, Money Won't Pay. You can find a link to that in the episode description. Um, hey, if you, hey, tell a friend about our show. We've, I don't think we've ever asked anybody to do that, but um, we yeah, really if you appreciate get, If you get some good vibes from this show and you have a friend who could also use some good vibes, please recommend it. We try to be a good vibes show, and I think there's people who could be helped by that instead of just, you know, the bad vibes show. Like, you know, the show where they talk about all this stuff that they hate and the stuff they think really stinks. I mean, that's basically the news. Am I right? Am I right, people? Uh, thank you to Maximum Fun for hosting our show and for putting out all sorts of great programs. Bubble is very good, if you haven't heard Bubble. It is good. I listened to a lot more of it while we were traveling to San Diego. Um, oh, yeah, and you got to see all those folks. I did. There. Well, not all those folks. I saw Jordan Morris at a, a at a fun party, but I think that was it. I was only there for like about 13 hours. Yeah. <laughs> it was a wild one. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. Um, and oh, if people want to send in their own submissions, how do they do that? Wonderful podcast at gmail.com. Um, if you want to hear more McElroy shows, you can go to McElroyshows.com. Uh, one more quick note. Uh, we've mentioned our PO box in the past. Uh, we are having to transfer that. Um, so stop sending stuff to it until we'll we t- know, we yeah. will let you know when we have a new PO box. Um, yes. So just sort of chill on that for a little bit. Uh, okay. That's it. So, um, I'm out of outro juice too. Oh, Griffin. Um, can we air more jokes about smooth? Is there another Santana? Song? You didn't ask me who I would replace it with. Oh uh, yeah. Who'd you replace it with? For Smooth, the song by Carlos Santana and Rob Thomas. John Mayer. Oh, God. And Blake Shelton. Oh, my (laughs) God. (laughs) You have to legally say that was a joke. I'd call it smoother. Oh, my God, Rachel. (laughs) You have to say this is a joke. Out loud, because people will cut it and they'll lose the context of it being a joke. And then we'll be run out of town on a rail. It drops September 2018. Look for it. 
for smoother the sequel to smooth with john mayer and blake shelton uh-huh. Get, you gotta say you're joking because now i don't know if you think this song would be smoother than smooth by rob thomas and carlos santana it is a joke griffin oh thank god Money won't pay. Money won't pay. 